My name is Sanford Sells. I'm a retired detective from Knoxville, Tennessee. When I retired nearly 10 years ago now, I meant it. I didn't want to search for anybody or anything ever again. Looking for my TV remote is the most in-depth sleuthing I did during the first six of those years. Then my granddaughter came over on her birthday. She was a teenager. She turned 14. And as always, her mother had the party at my house since I had much more room to accommodate such events than she did. I didn't mind. Though, at my age, it's difficult to maintain a smile in a room full of teenagers. Especially teenagers hyped up on cake and ice cream. I kind of thought they outgrew the effects of sugar. Apparently, I was wrong. And so, in the middle of opening her gifts, Sophie picks up a small, pretty package. And when I say small, I mean it literally fit in the palm of her hand. I thought it was probably jewelry, and so I didn't crane around the others to watch her open it. If it was a necklace or some such, she'd show it to me. When she opened it, a hush fell over the gathering. I saw excited expressions, and it was like watching a thunderstorm about to happen. All at once, Sophie squealed with delight. And just like that, they were all clamoring to get a better look at whatever was in the small package. They were all so excited, and I was sure it was something of high value. Her mother sat at the end of the table, smiling contently. I was confused, and before I knew it, I was craning my neck to see this thing. It made a slight whirring sound, and all I could see was a blur of something spinning in her hand. More precisely, she held the thing pinched between her thumb and her middle finger. When it stopped spinning, all I saw was a neon green plastic thing that resembled the old electric shaver head in my upstairs bathroom. And then she spun it again. All the kids started asking if they could have a turn. Her gift cards, music CDs, the sweater I bought her, all lay forgotten at the other end of the table as she incessantly spun that thing, and deftly avoided handing it over to anyone else for the next ten minutes or so. Now I asked her mother what it was, and she called it a fidget spinner. I asked her if it was expensive, and she shook her head. She bought that one for five bucks at the local pharmacy. I asked what it was made of. I was shocked to learn it was mostly plastic with some small ball bearings. And that explained the whirring noise anyway, but not the total and complete enthrallment of a room full of teenagers. By the end of the party, everyone had taken several turns with the fidget spinner, and Sophie entrusted it to my care while she accompanied her friends outside to be picked up. I can't say I was sad to see them all go out the door, either. Looking at the absurd spinner, I gave it a few spins. Nothing spectacular, and certainly nothing I would have thought Sophie would be that excited about. I laid it on the table and started clearing away the discarded wrapping paper and paper plates, just thinking a little bit of the spinner toy. I had a spinning top as a child, and I guess the fidget was just this generation's version of the same toy. By the end of the month, it would surely be remanded to a pile of forgotten things that exist in every kid's room. But I was wrong. On her weekly visits, my granddaughter proudly showed me other fidget spinners she had bought since her birthday. They varied in size and color, but they all did the same thing. They spun. Three months passed, and again, on a weekly visit, Sophie urged her mom to show me the spinner she had bought for herself. My daughter was a bit embarrassed, but consented, handing over a brightly colored spinner. Amazed, I asked, Oh, you actually carry this around with you? You use it? When she nodded, I only had one question. Why? It was beyond me why an adult would have need of a spinner. She shrugged an answer and dropped it back in her purse. I don't know, Dad. She shrugged. It's kind of soothing to spin them. And it keeps her nibbling at her nails. Sophie giggled as she tossed her spinner in the air and caught it on the tip of her finger. A while after that, 
I went to a doctor's appointment. When you get my age, that's about the most excitement you have in a month. The trip to the doctor. If that's not enough, he starts telling you everything that's wrong with you, and then warns you to get rid of any stress in your life. My doctor was doing just that, and my pulse quickened. I knew my health wasn't the best. I've been a detective for nearly 32 years. That's hard on anyone's health. And when he gave me the spiel about removing stress from my life, well, (laughs) I got laughing. It wasn't so much the bad news he was giving me. But I had thought about my daughter saying the spinner was soothing, and imagined myself using a fidget spinner and doing tricks with it like Sophie had done. Doctors, well, they don't have much of a sense of humor, it seems. When he asked what was funny, I told him. He cleared his throat, adjusted his glasses, and said, Well, Mr. Sells, you might actually be onto something there. Vidget spinners have been known to help people with anxiety disorders and, well, even kids with ADHD. Maybe for once the younger generation has come up with something beneficial. He opened my file. It might help with your blood pressure. If something doesn't get it down, well, I'm going to have to increase your medicine and maybe add something mild for your nerves. He patted my shoulder, smiled, and stood. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, Guys your age and with the career you held for so long often end up in much worse shape. I'll see you in a couple months, Mr. Sells. And he left the room. It was at dinner with some of my retired friends that I noticed how many people had fidget spinners. The restaurant was quite large and noisy as I entered. It was a family restaurant, so there were several families with kids sitting around. I counted eight spinners as I walked to our table. At least it gave me something different and novel to open the conversation with. It ended up being all we talked about, really. Spinners had made the news everywhere, it seemed. Even the Russians had chipped in with their opinion about the cheap toys, calling them mind control objects. Some thought the Chinese had invented them because they were mostly made in China. Some thought America invented them. China just manufactured them for the U.S. companies. And everyone seemed to think they were invented for political reasons. It was jaw-dropping to me. Then I began to notice how the things spread like a virus all over the United States. Schools wanted them banned. Stores couldn't keep them in stock. Kids loved them. Parents applauded their simplicity, which seemed to present them with alternatives to having their kids medicated for anxiety and ADD and ADHD. Well, probably a plethora of other mental issues as well. For my own birthday that year, Sophie bought me a fidget spinner, a titanium-colored one, stating that she thought I'd like it better because, well, it didn't look so girly. And that night, as I watched yet another news segment about the possibly harmful side effects of the spinners, I twirled mine, listening to its soft, whirring noise. Soon, I wasn't watching the news. I was watching the endlessly spinning toy in my hand. I wasn't hearing the weather report or the local news reports. I was hearing the soft, slightly metallic whirring of the tiny bearings on the toy. Before I knew it, I had dozed off in my comfortable chair. I woke with a start when the thing slipped from my hand and clattered noisily on the hardwood floor. To my horror, it had broken into several pieces and the tiny bearings had scattered in every direction. I picked up all I could find and put them at the end table, making a mental note to buy another one so Sophie wouldn't know I'd destroyed her gift to me on the first day that I'd had it. Now the next day, I set out to find a titanium-colored fidget replacement. At noon, I gave up and got lunch at a cafe. Afterward, I headed for the mall. Now I hated the mall. It was the size of a small city and twice as populated. Everywhere I went, I saw kids and even adults with fidget spinners. And I started noticing how calm the kids were. How zombified they looked as they flipped their spinners and followed their parents listlessly from one store to another. It was as if I'd stepped into an alternate reality. Kids don't act that way. 
At least, not on planet Earth. But there were veritable hordes of people and kids milling through the stores, and I could still hear the creepy music tinkling out from the Build-A-Bear store. I could hear the televisions at the pagodas playing their endless advertisements. The kids' play areas were quiet, and all the toys sat in their designated places. No kids were playing in them. It was unusual and creepy. I found a replacement for my own spinner at one of the specialty pagodas. The teenaged attendant grinned and asked if I only needed one, because he was sure a man my age had more than one grandkid to buy for. I assured him I only needed the one, paid the ungodly $25, and I walked away. I sat for a while on the bench in the center of the store, watching as kids walked by me, staring intently at their spinners. I saw that some had the flat ones like I had, and others had cube-shaped ones. Their eyes were empty. They were taking in nothing of their surroundings. They could step around obstacles and never take their eyes off the toy. It was amazing and terrifying. And that's when I began to think maybe some of the conspiracy theories going around might be onto something. I'm sure to begin with it was the detective in me. I had always been curious about things and, well, hell, for a few years into my retirement, I'd done nothing but sit around watching daytime TV and playing in my little garden. So I decided right there in the middle of that too quiet mall that I was going to investigate the phenomenon a little bit, see what I could find out. That day was a few years ago. That's right, years. And the first thing I found out was that the toy had indeed been invented right here in the good old US of A. Someone had done a lot of work to cover up exactly who the inventor was, though. I became obsessed with finding him. After months of searching... I finally found the man smack in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. I won't tell you how many favors I called in to get the man's address and background check, though. So I decided to pay Mr. Shrews a visit. I told my daughter I was driving up to Illinois to see an old friend. It wouldn't do for her to know the extent of my recent obsession. She'd worried and tried to talk me out of it. And as it turned out, Mr. Shrews worked at an agricultural plant and spent his spare time writing. He knew what fidget spinners were. He had kids, but he knew nothing of the invention. We had a laugh. I apologized for wasting his evening. And he assured me that he would put the meeting to one of his horror novels. Maybe I'd found the wrong man. Maybe my detective skills were rusty. But I couldn't let it go. I went back to the paperwork online and sat for hours on end searching through everything I could find on the spinner invention. In one file, the spinners were linked to a federal corporation called BBWO. I couldn't find what the acronym stood for anywhere, but there was a line far into their public online files that tied them to the CIA. My palm sweated when I saw that. I mean... After MK Ultra and Operation Paperclip, just to name two famous ones, who knew what freaky pies the CIA had their fingers in these days? With further research and the calling in of more favors, I found that the BBWO answered to the CIA. It seemed the separate entity on the surface, raking in revenue from sales of products, which, well, looked like bullshit to me. How much money can a corporation make from the sale of modified and restored furniture? Or from a few licenses they held on to cartoon characters and universes? Why would the CIA be involved with BBWO if mundane shit like that is all they dealt with? They wouldn't. Well, I jumped into that and researched every link I could think of. All of them ended up being dead ends, just like the Mr. Shrews in Illinois. At the end of my rope, I almost gave up. And then I saw a news story about the corporation brought down by one employee. One brave employee who dared stand up against what was going on. 
and that's all I had to find. One person who worked for the BBWO, or one who used to work for them. And I did. She had seven separate locks on the inside of her front door. It was a bit excessive considering she lived in a nice upscale rural neighborhood in Virginia. I'll call her Juliet to retain her anonymity. She was an older lady who worked at a remote location for the BBWO. She told me she had started working for them in the late 70s, when they had been called Smart Gadgets. Now in all my research, I'd never run across that name, only that the corporation had been started in the early 80s. Julia said she found their toys amusingly simple, cheap to manufacture, and affordable for families on any budget. And at first, she was happy to work there. She made good money for doing their paperwork. Then when BBWO took the company, she had to sign a non-disclosure contract. She said the men she dealt with after that were shady-looking characters who always used false names. Mr. Smith obviously being the most widely used. They wore suits and made sure to never talk any business in her presence. She said that's when the toy business she had first started working for changed into something that felt more sinister. She accidentally saw Mr. Smith's badge and gun as she left her boss's office one day, and it made her curious. Then, there was the paperwork on her boss's desk that looked official, like government official, which he promptly scooped up to keep her from seeing. So... Like a nosy dummy, I stayed late one night. You know back then, they didn't have cameras anywhere like they do now. She shifted in her seat. I picked the lock to the office, got into the bottom of the filing cabinet, and pulled out a folder labeled Top Secret. She giggled nervously. It sounded so far-fetched, but I swear to God it's true. I assured her that I believed her and urged her to continue. Well... The new toys were being invented by scientists brought over here from Germany after World War II. I know because I checked out some of the names of the inventors. Then I did something even dumber and played amateur sleuth. Maybe I'd read too many Agatha Christie novels. She shifted again and looked nervously out her window toward the street and then back to me. She whispered, The toys were used as mind control gadgets. She raised her eyebrows and sat back on the couch. So, the CIA owns and operates BBWO, so they can mass distribute these mind control toys. I wanted to disbelieve her, but I couldn't. I could tell that Juliet believed every word that she was telling me. She had nothing to gain from lying about it. Well, not to me anyway. She nodded. I told one of my girlfriends over drinks one evening. I was tipsy and it just slipped out. She got a good laugh and I thought it was the end of it. But two weeks later, I attended her funeral. She died in a car wreck nearly a hundred miles from her home. And to my horror, her husband told me she had been ranting about CIA mind control for the past week. And he thought she was going crazy. I think the wrong person overheard and he killed her, because less than a month later, he died in a suspicious accident too. They weren't the only ones, so I kept my lips sealed after that one slip-up. I'll never forgive myself for causing those two deaths and possibly even more. She swiped a tear from her cheek. When I asked what BBWO stood for, she told me it was building a better world order. Can you believe that? Hardly anyone has ever heard of them. They say publicly that they build furniture, run a couple kids' charities, and control rights to some TV or movie characters, or something like that. She scoffed, rolling her eyes. They're still making those damn toys, Mr. Sells. The stuff they don't want the public to find online, they keep in paper files. Where? I wanted to get my hands on proof. She licked her lips and looked out the window again, shaking her head. It's too dangerous nowadays, 
There's cameras everywhere. Security guards around the clock. She shook her head again. After nearly a half hour more, I charmed her into giving me an address to an isolated location in Virginia. You'll never get in there, and if you do, you might not make it out if they know what you're looking for. I thanked her for her concern and left, and as I stepped onto the porch, I heard her sliding locks into place and turning her bolt locks. I passed the black car parked alongside the road as I left her neighborhood. The man in the car was looking at a map. An honest-to-God paper map. He looked too young to know how to use a paper map, and it raised red flags for me. As I passed the back of his car, I noted the government tag. I waited until the following weekend to take the trip to the location Julia had told me about. I was wondering if I was batshit crazy for even thinking about attempting such a stupid stunt at my age. And the answer was, yes, I probably am crazy. After casing the little squat square building, I saw there were only two guards. There were cameras on every corner and even in the parking lot, though. I would have to call in more favors. And, well, I was running out of favors to call in. It took several months to find someone who could hack into the security cameras for me. But when that finally happened... I got all the information I needed, and it was recorded to a laptop and then copied onto a flash drive. I didn't enter into this thing lightly. I know, you're thinking old codger like me don't have many ticks of the clock left on his timeline anyway. But let me assure you, no matter how old you get, you don't want to shorten that timeline. Let me just say it was the most exciting thing I've done since retiring. I hired a group of rowdy teenage boys to start a fire at the back of the building to distract the guards. My hacker guy, he wasn't a friend, but more or less a hired thug who'd been in trouble for hacking a few times. He took care of the cameras for me, and dear sweet Juliet took care of the lock codes by giving them to me. She said the files I wanted were in the wall vault in the main office. After slipping in, I went straight to the office in the wall vault. It used the pin pad code to unlock too, but Juliet didn't know the code for it. I'd have to figure it out. I had a little help. The hacker had given me a digital lock-breaking electronic device, and when the lock finally popped and the door opened, I laughed. I thought it would be much more difficult and time-consuming. I found a file about halfway through the stack stamped with the word spinners. I took the file along with a few others, and there was a stack over a foot high of files in that vault. I could have taken them all, but I didn't want anyone to notice the break-in. I got out without notice and just before the fire trucks came roaring up the little paved road. Now I'm writing this to let you all know that fidget spinners of all shapes and sizes, paddle balls, yo-yos, sand pendulums, perpetual motion toys, and even the seemingly harmless slinky were all created as mind control toys by the CIA. There are more, but I won't list them all here. It's all on my notes, and well, all my notes are hidden in lockers at bus stations, on flash drives, and in paper files. The best of you amateur sleuths will undoubtedly find them and do with them as you will. But fortunately, my time has run out to spread the word as I intended to do. You see, there's a man parked alongside the road in front of my house reading a paper map. He follows me everywhere and I act like I don't see him. He has been alone for the past month, but today... Well, I saw another car further up the road, and I'm sure my phone has been tapped, and my house is under surveillance. Just this morning on the news, I saw that Juliet had been killed in a car accident. I'm positive I'm next. Someone needs to find these notes and find a way to stop the BBWO before it's too late.